The following program may contain coarse language, violence, nudity, mature subject matter, or scenes which may not be suitable for all viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome back to the Exxon, everyone. What a night it's been. Our first guest, we were talking about psychic phenomena, tarot cards. Last hour, we were talking about demons, exorcisms, and things that go wacko in the night. And uh, I, I figured out a new acronym for wacko or Waco. We ain't coming out. That's what the demons are saying these days. And this hour, Mark McCandlish is my special guest. We've had the pleasure of having Mark on the show before. He's an internationally recognized artist who has specialized in aviation and conceptual art within the defense and aerospace industries for the better part of his last 30 years, serving the needs of many of the top American corporations in this regard. Mark's father was a 25-year veteran of the United States Air Force, and as a consequence, Mark had a lifelong love of aviation and aviation history. His first UFO and sighting was at Westover Air Force Base in the state of Massachusetts in the winter of 1966, and he observed the craft through an 80-power telescope for about 10 minutes before it accelerated out of sight at an alarming velocity. He later discovered that this craft had been hovering above a flight of uh, nuclear-armed B-52s sitting at the alert ramp on the flight line at, at that base. Mark spent most of his life trying to discover the science that would be behind such an incredible performance, and if it was actually possible, and he believes there's a plausible answer to interstellar flight without violating the currently accepted laws of physics. Having literally dozens of sightings since 1966, Mark feels that this is carefully protected technology and has been uh, co-opted by a yet unknown group. Hmm. And uh, the sequestration of this technology has provided that organization tremendous leverage in world politics, finance, and international conflicts over the past five decades. www.markmccandlish is his website. And Mark, always great having you here on the Exxon, my friend. How have you been? Hi, Rob. Thank you so much for having me back. Yeah, I'm doing fine. Thank you. Excellent. Um, you know, with what's happening in the Middle East uh, these days, we've got the United States back involved in a theater where they're, even though the president is saying no no boots will hit the ground, they've already got over 3,000 boots on the ground. Uh, we're using technology, drone technology, high surveillance aircraft uh, technology in order to find the targets that will be um, that will be targeted by not only the United States but other countries around the world. And, and it seems, Mark, whenever these these new theaters of operation open up, we don't hear a lot about UFO sightings, not only in the area, but around the world. And I was wondering, Mark, do you have any idea why this is? Well, as it turns out, Rob, um, in recent months, there has been uh, a marked increase in the number of UFO sightings, in spite of what you may have heard elsewhere in the media. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know that uh, Peter Davenport has been reporting uh, an unusually high number of UFO sightings over the past few months. And, in fact, uh, I've, I've actually talked to servicemen who've come back from the Middle East uh, ever since the Persian Gulf War uh, who, who did, in fact, see UFOs over combat theater areas. But these UFOs that these fine men and women 
uh, who who protect us uh, that are coming back from these theaters around the world. Is it possible that what they're experiencing and what they're seeing are actually new technology surveillance um, aircraft? I have no doubt. Uh, I think that that's uh, uh, pretty much foregone conclusion. Mm-hmm. The uh, the average person looks at the the level of aerospace technology that's out there right now, and they tend to think of the SR seventy one Blackbird as being you know the uh, sort of epitome of aerospace uh, technology. Right. When in fact that was an aircraft that was being designed in the late fifties, early nineteen sixties, was flying in the nineteen sixties, and was retired a few years ago. But uh, there are things that fly much ha- uh, higher and much faster now. In fact, there's there are things that use some pretty exotic propulsion systems. I've, I've had occasion to see a few of these mm-hmm. things, uh, and um, they're truly remarkable. Whatever happened, Mark, to the Aurora? That used to be so prevalent in the UFO community that a lot of the early UFO researchers were kind of tending to believe, oh, wait a minute, that's not a UFO, that's the Aurora. And then, bang, we don't hear about it anymore. Well, there were several generations of aircraft in that particular program. Um, the the first uh, aircraft in that particular uh, family of vehicles was uh, an unmanned uh, area vehicle. It was probably one of the largest, uh, highest flying and fastest flying uh, aircraft or uh, unmanned aircraft uh, in the inventory. Uh, that particular vehicle was, uh, was somewhat shaped like a flattened out football, sort of a diamond shape, uh, very similar to uh, what Ben Rich or Kelly Johnson referred to as the hopeless diamond shape. Uh, It uh, was entirely covered with space shuttle tiles, had 121 vertical launch tubes in its belly for importing different kinds of munitions, uh, both uh, conventional weapons and nuclear warheads. Mark, we're going to have to do a bit of a cliffhanger here. I've got to take my uh, first break here. Mark okay. McCandlish is my special guest, a great friend of the Exxon. www.markmccandlish.com. And Mark and I will be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Named one of the world's greatest psychics, Elizabeth Joyce is now giving readings worldwide via Skype. Elizabeth Joyce is recognized for her clairvoyant ability to help find missing persons, her analysis of dreams, past life regression work, mediumship, and her accurate predictions. Elizabeth has been a frequent guest on the X-Zone radio show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, now for several years. For an appointment with Elizabeth Joyce, call 201-934-8986 or Skype at elizabeth.joyce. And for more information, you can always visit Elizabeth Joyce online at www.new-visions.com. Mark McCandlish is my guest this hour, Exonation, www.markmccandlish.com. And uh, before we went to the commercial break, Mark, you and I were discussing the Aurora. And um, please uh, go on with that because I'm sure there's a lot of old guys like me who'd like to know what really happened. Well, that particular aircraft 
uh, was capable of uh, traveling at speeds up to Mach 17, which is roughly 12,000 miles per hour. Wow. Of course, that, that depends to a large degree on the altitude and the air density at which you're flying. Uh, use some pretty exotic fuels. And there's there's been some uh, debate about whether it was a methane-based or a slush, uh, partially solidified hydrogen-type fuel. Um, but it, it had three different propulsion systems, uh, one that would allow it to take off and land uh, from an airfield um, with engines very similar to the, uh, the high-bypass bi- turbojet engines that were used in the SR-71. Uh, but then it had an external uh, propulsion system that was an awful lot like what is called a linear aerospike engine. And what this really uh, was constructed out of was a, a, a slight ridge that ran laterally across both the dorsal and ventral surfaces, had a series of what looked like fuel injectors pointing outward, and once it got up to a particular velocity, fuel would be sprayed intermittently into the airstream right at that the trailing edge of the ridge, and it would basically combust and expand between the supersonic shock wave that separated from the surface of the vehicle at that point and the tapered afterbody. So it would more or less pinch the afterbody, uh, driving it forward. Um, so it was, the entire back end of the aircraft was like a linear aerospace engine. The, the problem was that it had a tendency to erode the space shuttle tiles very rapidly when the when the engine was running nonstop, and so they they began uh, experimenting, and they found that the best way to um, operate this particular configuration was in a pulsed uh, detonation kind of an operation, where uh, they would spray fuel out for about five seconds, and then they would rest for ten. So once it got up to speed, it was basically pulsing on and and turning off, and and for this reason, it was nicknamed the Pulsar, uh, the the Aurora Pulsar. Uh, the vehicle was unique in that it had um, tires that looked like uh, that. Uh, you, you've probably been to a car show, occasionally seen uh, special hoses that people put on their engines that have kind of a bread, braided uh, sort of stainless steel mesh wire yes, yeah. structure to the, the hoses. Well, imagine a loop of that wrapped around a wheel, and that's oh. what the tires look like on this particular aircraft. And that was a, a design that was specifically meant to be able to withstand the unusually high temperatures that the airframe was subject to. So, so what happened but, uh, to it? Why, why did they...? Well, it, from what I've heard, it, the aircraft was not that reliable. In mm. fact, uh, one of the contractors that I'd done some work for uh, through Lockheed had indicated that um, there was an occasion where uh, a vehicle of this type was coming into Edwards Air Force Base and, um, had a problem cycling from the high-speed engine set to the uh, turbo ramjets uh, or turbo uh, high-bypass turbojets that would allow it to land. And so the pilot who was operating the vehicle remotely uh, was instructed to take the aircraft out over the ocean and sort out the problem, and if not uh, able to resolve it, to put it into the drink so it wouldn't be recovered. Um, it took him 15 minutes to sort out the problem so that he could bring the aircraft back to Edwards and land it, and by that time he was over Hawaii. So if you look at uh, the distance to Hawaii from Holy Edwards, cow. it's about 3,000 miles, accomplished in 12, uh, 15 minutes, which means that you're traveling, uh, you know, 3,000 times four, 12,000 miles per hour, and depending on the altitude, that's Mach 17. So this is in 1986. So uh, that gives you an idea of just tru- how truly advanced some of these these vehicles are or were at that time, and, and now we're looking, you know, almost uh, 30 years later. Um, so you have to imagine that uh, the kinds of vehicles that are out there are probably uh, even more remarkable. I, I know that there was a second generation in that family of aircraft because I was asked to do some conceptual artwork for the follow-up uh, second-generation uh, aircraft, and uh, you know, I, I can't really talk about uh, what that vehicle sure, looked understandable. like. Sure, uh, understandable. But uh, but I, I can tell you that it was capable of a similar performance in terms of its speed and altitude. Uh, probably a little uh, a little bit more conventional in terms of its appearance. In other words, you know, vertical stabilizers and that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Um, so that uh, there were some things that it could do. And in fact, uh, a number of these aircraft even have um, 
internal rocket engines so that they can do a, a maneuver that's called a zoom climb, where they go into a shallow dive from high altitude and then they pull up and they can go right out into space.